Okay, so I am just reading this for Laura, so don't um, ask us any, well, we can talk about the questions, but we can't necessarily answer them. <coughs> right. So this paper considers the past in terms of its potential futures, using a reevaluation of the concepts of continuity and change to provoke different kinds of questions about <coughs> time and the historical process. The much critiqued traditional paradigm explaining the late Iron Age and early Roman transition in Britain quantified continuity and change by the presence and absence of features that were retained from before the imperial occupation or introduced after this point, bringing into view an Iron Age landscape <coughs> of hill forts, farms, and roundhouses versus a Roman landscape of towns, villas, forts, and roads. This view measured change as a matter of transition, identifying the future as a coherent post-transition trend. Process is directional and oriented toward a future, the markers of a Roman landscape. That is already known beforehand. The problem of continuity and change under Roman imperial occupation connects to wider conversations on deconstructing acculturation models of transformation in cross-cultural colonial contexts. In the acculturation paradigm, <coughs> Agency and innovation are confined to, the, confined to the domain of the colonizer, such that whether and which changes, sorry, such that whether and which changes occur post-transition have often been the focus of analysis. Continuity is seen as a less interesting default state of retention. Because something can be either continuity or change, Acculturation implicitly assumes that change necessitates transformation to something other, and that without external influence, there is no change. All transformations post-transition become absorbed by a directional narrative, and the pre-colonial baseline serves as the only, only critical context for what it looks like to continue or persist. There have been <laughs> Numerous challenges to this model of acculturation in a wide variety of geographic, temporal, and disciplinary contexts, arguing that continuity should not be reduced to only what is available in an archeological record before the colonial or imperial border. Continuity is not just the absence of change defined as new material. Continuities are worked into the present and can be translated and transformed as they unfold, acting as the context of their own transformation. In this sense, there are multiple possible continuities. The future, or continuity of the past, could have become something else. It could have been otherwise. Continuity does not always or only have to be rooted to a roundhouse, for example. Nor does a rectangular house always or only point to a total condition of change. In other words, there is not only one way that continuity can look, or only one time and place that it can be found. Continuity and change are interactive rather than separate outcomes. This approach to continuity and change is not meant to negotiate, uh, sorry, to negate the possibility of traditions that drew their significance from deep timescales, nor does it call for a downplaying of transformations that would have occurred under the conditions of differences in the Roman imperial context. It is meant to unlocate continuity and change from a fixed conceptual territory. The structure of the question itself plays a role in how these analytical options are conceived. Expectations about what an explanation should entail presuppose certain conditions about time, space, scale, context, and process. Framing the question around if things change or not after a fixed measuring point confines continuity and change to impermeable dimensions that do not interact. Central to a process of rethinking and redoing continuity and change is rearticulating the concept of the past and its relationship to time and the future. A different approach to the structure of inquiry, one that centers on exploring the past as conditions of possibilities, confronts the multiple tendencies of pasts and presents rather than winnowing down the historical narrative only to the context relevant to explain the origin, development origin and developmental trajectory of an already defined category. The goal is to engage with the multiplicity of contexts for interaction rather than distilling times and places to either or domains, removing the continuity change axis as the dominant framework. 
A focus on possibilities is not a call to simply imagine what might have happened, but to consider what is materialized as the product of potentially competing visions of the future that might have looked less inevitable or been subject to different narratives of inevitability from the present vantage point. As archaeologist Stephen Silliman argues, quote, considering alternative explanations is crucial because these alternatives not only circumscribe interpretation, but also served as actual alternatives, actions and choices for individuals in the past. Alternative options are not simply a byproduct of the winnowing process when selecting an explanation for the material evidence. Some of these alternatives may have constituted part of the context of possibilities that brought something to bear on the decisions, actions, and interventions of people in the past. The materialized outcome of the future may have been different from what was anticipated. Approaching the past in this way requires a more dynamic view of how multiple temporalities connect. A teleological narrative isolates the past as an authentic reality of what happened, seeking to explain this what was. This is what was. No, this what was. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this what was traces what seems relevant for an assumed endpoint, for example, the Roman province of Britannia, and elides or distances that which does not speak to the development of the a priori endpoint. This kind of directional process presupposes itself by constructing an otherwise as anachronistic or marginal as not of the same time or space. However, development is not necessarily imminent in the origin nor imminent in arrival. Seeing the past as it was can also be, seeing, can also be about seeing the past as it could have been. The ways in which hoped for inevitabilities did not materialize or could have intervened against alternative happenings. In other words, for the people living or experiencing it, there may have been different pasts or futures from what is now recognized from the standpoint of the researcher as critical moments, developmental trends, or inevitable outcomes. Historian David Carr argues that one must take into account the contingent <coughs> positionality of the agent Quote, the very attempt to represent the reality of an action requires that it be located in a time whose future reality was very different from what really happened. The temporal setting of an action includes much more than its intended consequences. And the past of the action for the agent, like its future, is not limited to its immediate antecedents. Historical explanation locates the agent and action within the settings that materialized but the agent and action were not situated with respect to the outcome. The future of the agent's anticipation is not necessarily what we see materialized, but it is this materialization to which we try to relate the agent's past, action, and reality. The reality and explanation must consider the possibilities of different futures from the trajectory that ended up happening, or different pasts from what seem like the antecedents of the action to the researcher. The setting of the agent is not only what happened, what appears actualized in the material record, but also about potential happenings in a contingent context of relationships. These potential happenings may have been critical in the context of the agent, however the intended and unintended consequences unfolded. For example, the temporal moment of the late Iron Age might not contain the whole spectrum of pasts or possible futures relevant for understanding the Roman imperial occupation. Understanding the past in a landscape of contingent contexts of possibilities opens up potentials for such alternative futures. Rather than residues of the already finished, the landscape constitutes ensembles of possibilities or stories so far. The time and place of action are thus not external to the social phenomena being investigated, but in fact are part of the phenomena to be explained. A sequential temporality that only populates a landscape with artifacts and places whose origin can be found within the borders of a temporal period obscures understanding the ongoing becoming of communities. This means that reconstructing an Iron Age landscape with only sites whose origins date to within the accepted period range would miss a lot of what is significant about this landscape, potentially minimi minimalizing focal points that continue to orient action and interaction beyond a role as remnant of the past. 
For example, the arrangement of features constructed during the Iron Age at the site of Ashford Prison in the Middle Thames Valley suggests that Neolithic earthworks at the site were still visible at the time. <laughs> Middle to late Iron Age four post structure eight. In the middle of the green zone. Um, I shouldn't have done that because now I've lost my place. Okay, so four post structure eight was erected uh, inside the monument. The earthworks appear to have been respected by the configuration of Iron Age circular structures. The excavators suggest that the layout of the Iron Age settlement strongly indicates that physical traces or ancestral knowledge of the earthworks of the Neolithic monument persisted. The Roman period enclosure at Ashford Prison encircles the Neolithic monument while it cuts through the features of the Iron Age settlement. Inhabitants at the site of Imperial College Sports Ground incorporated previous features into land enclosure configurations. Field structures were reused and modified into emerging systems of land demarcation and management. An enclosure, possibly originating in the late Bronze Age to early Iron Age, was integrated within the ditches of a Roman period enclosure and trackway, potentially accessed from the trackway. Parts of the Bronze Age field system persisted into later periods at Heathrow Terminal 5 as well, perhaps continuing to define boundaries or demarcate pasture. Most of the Iron Age and Roman period enclosures are multi-phase, set within the Bronze Age network, network of ditches, while separate late Iron Age and early Roman phases were difficult to distinguish at the site. Enclosure 3 and Enclosure 7, for example, have periods of use ranging from the late Iron Age, early Roman to the mid-Roman periods, while late Iron Age, early Roman enclosure 4 was modified and expanded into enclosure 5. Yeah. Thank you. Four into five. Thank you. <laughs> um, in the early stroke mid Roman landscape. Barbara Bender describes a landscape of settlements, fields, and stone monuments from roughly 4,000 years ago, a Bronze Age landscape, on Bodmin Moor, southwest England, investigated by a team of anthropologists and archaeologists. Speaking with people at the exhibition for art installations created as part of the project, the team saw, quote, how peculiar our myopic concentration on the Bronze Age landscape appeared to most local people who saw stone row, sorry, who saw stone row medieval field systems, 17th century granite working, and 19th century peat cutting, either as layered palimpsest or more simply as history. In the late Iron Age struck early Roman case, the contexts of the past were available as dynamic and potent options for grappling with the contingent future set in motion under the imperial occupation. Going back to Carr, quote, the past of the action for the agent, like its future, is not limited to its immediate antecedents. The point here is not simply that Neolithic monuments and Bronze Age earthworks and field features persisted at some locations into the Iron Age and Roman periods, nor that disruptions or realignments should be downplayed. The argument is that when looking for an Iron Age or Roman landscape or considering transformation under Roman occupation in terms of the landscape, multiple temporalities may cohere and conflict in one period. In other words, to understand the Iron Age as the context of the Roman invasion, the Iron Age may not be enough. The past may, quote, over, overflow its limits. It's possible that the monuments or networks of banks and ditches in some cases were neutralized as a relic of the past, but it's also possible that these temporalities were not so sequential. They may have coexisted or otherwise interrupted other trajectories. To bring some thoughts together, Connecting the interactive view of continuity and change presented at the beginning of this paper with an orientation towards time that considers the futures of the past, it is not just that continuity and change interact with each other, or that variability cross-cuts a sequential temporality in the landscape. Also at issue are simultaneous differences in spheres of interaction and the simultaneous presence of histories that do not necessarily speak to a post-transition trend as the only relevant future for the past. Key here is asking about the condition of possibilities, the multiple potentially actualizing futures, rather than isolating only the patterns that seem relevant for explaining a causal or a temporal sequence. What was significant in the landscape might have operated under different terms and been orientated towards different futures altogether. And thank you, Laura Gislaney, for couldn't do this.